Thank you, Michael. That was beautiful. Good morning. How are you this morning? Yeah, good to see everybody today. And happy Memorial Day. Yes, I feels a little bit like an oxymoron when we say happy before this idea of Memorial Day, right? Because Memorial Day is that day that we really honor those that have given their life in service to our country. And so I want to simply bless all those that have come before us who have given that ultimate sacrifice to protect our country. And so if that's somebody in your family, I bless them as well. It reminds me of a uh, story. There was a young man who was standing before the bulletin board in the social hall, and the pastor noticed him, and he walked up, and he said, good morning, Johnny. How are you? Johnny said, I'm, I'm good. I'm just curious. Who are all these people on this board, all these men and women? And the pastor said, well, Johnny, those are all the individuals, the men and women who have died in service. And Johnny looked up at the board again, and then he looked up at the pastor with a trembling voice and asked, which service, the 9 a.m. or the 11? <laughs> just another example of how misunderstood this weekend is. <laughs> yes, um, we are uh, closing out our month here in May, the last, uh, last weekend of the month, and we've been talking ab about this beautiful theme of living out loud, and for this month we've been looking at the light within the shadows, and so we've been talking a, a lot about the shadow. We've been talking about this idea of looking at our subconscious and the ideas there that um, maybe repressed experiences that we might not have dealt with that show up in our shadow. And some of you have asked, why would I want to do that? <laughs> you know, why would I want to dig into my shadow and bring up repressed ideas and, and experiences that, that I've had? Well, I think in order to really answer that question, we have to back up a little bit and think about the way things happen and the way things are created. I have said, and I will continue to say, everything's created twice, first in consciousness and then in form. And so as we work with this thing called the creative process, we are always working with divine intelligence. We're working with that beautiful, purified spirit that moves through life, bringing its perfection from the highest idea into form through us. I want to invite you to put your hands up like this. All right, you are the center of creation. Creation moves from all that is down through us and into this world. You can bring your hands down now. But it's just a little tangible idea about the creative process moving through you, moving through each one of us. And so as we begin to work with this thing called the creative process, we want to do this consciously. Holmes talks about the creative process this way. The creative process is an action of mind with a capital M upon itself with a capital I, whether it be the great universal mind as God creating a universe or the action of mind in the human in their individual use of it. True creation is the unfoldment of an idea to create something new out of apparently nothing. This may be illustrated by musicians working out a musical composition, an artist putting together a beautiful painting, or perhaps an inventor conceiving of something no one has thought of before. The original impulse is in feeling, which develops into action through ideation. As the result, 
the idea unfolds in mine, and everything necessary for its perfect fulfillment is created with it. So the creative process is the, is it, once we understand it, for, for me, when I came to this philosophy, the creative process started to explain a lot. It helped me with the sort of magic formula about how I could be co-creative in the world, how I could begin to use this thing called the creative process because as Holmes says, he's talking about this metaphysical, um, the metaphysics of creation, and, and just to repeat, the creative process is an action of mind upon itself, whether it be the great universal mind as God creating a universe, or the action of mind in the human in their individual use of it. And so we are the microcosm from the macrocosm. That's what that passage in the Bible metaphysically means when it says that God created humanity in its own image. God created all of life and it, it, it expresses itself through us so that when we are moving through the world, when we are having our experiences, we are creative individuals. Now, the, the tricky part about the creative process, though, is that we're using all of consciousness. And then it gets individuated into our experiences and our beliefs. And when that happens, it's like a filter. If you can imagine a filter that the sunlight of the spirit is moving through, and that filter is our beliefs and our experiences and all the things that, that we create in the world. Now, most times, it's pretty good, right? Pretty good. We have a pretty good experience out in the world. But sometimes, that experience gets a little tangled up. I think it was um, Houston Smith who wrote World Religions who said, the problem with religion is that people get involved. <laughs> and I could turn that around and for purposes of talking about the creative process and I could say that the problem with the creative process is that people get involved. We bring our beliefs and our experiences to that creative process and, and when we embody a principle, it has its application by means of us. We are the the, the litmus um, test of what's in the part of the individuated consciousness that we hold. And so oftentimes, uh, we'll have some kind of, ex uh, or it's never one thing. It's never just one thing that causes us. I mean, sometimes you'll hear a new student, you know, misspeak, and they'll say, oh, I said this wrong thing. Am I going to create this? The, you know, I, I said that something was stupid or that I hated it. Am I, I going to create out of that? We, it, it takes the energy behind the words for us to begin to do that kind of creation. I was um, thinking about this idea of the creative process and how that's involved with, with um, how we create things in the world and how sometimes we have experiences that are, are unlovely and we have an, enough of them that they begin to shade and, and filter our experiences. And I, and I was thinking about how innocent it can be. Sometimes it's true, you know, people experience tra tragedy in the world, it's true. All the people who gave them lo their lives for our country in service, clearly that was a tragedy and it was a tragedy for the the families who lost that person. But sometimes it's just an accumulation of e even innocent things. I was driving down the road and I was turning the corner and I saw this three-year-old happily playing in the yard. And then she started to, uh, she was running in circles and she started running towards the road and her mother started running after her and the mother reached for her and the only thing she could grab was her hair. Ooh. And I heard this little girl scream. And I thought to myself, 
Those are the moments, right? Those are the moments when we have an experience. Maybe, you know, she internalizes at three years old, right? She internalizes some idea about, you know, when I don't listen, I get hurt, or when I play too hard, I feel I have pain. Some kind of innocent idea that gets planted in us. Now, it takes a lot of those types of experiences to really begin to create a shadow. If we have a number of experiences like that, that's what creates the shadow within us. Oftentimes, we have so many more positive experiences that they crowd out those individual experiences. And so as we look at this idea of the, the shadow that gets created by a number of experiences where we begin to interpret them in a way that is um, not... Not, it doesn't really lift us up. It doesn't give us the positive experience that we're looking for. We begin to interpret some in, you know, simple things that happen in our day-to-day -day life. We begin to interpret them through these filters. And that creates the shadow that we're, that we're talking about today. And the thing I want you to know is that as a, as a philosophy and as a religious scientist, we have the ability to use our spiritual practices, our spiritual tools, the classes that we take to really let our light shine. But there is an amazing capacity for resilience in the human spirit. And that um, capacity in, for resilience is, I, if you will, mind when we begin to do our spiritual practice, meditation, when we do affirmations, when we begin to do that work of drawing up that which is not serving us and releasing it, right, instead of holding on to it. So we talked a lot about the individual shadow work, and I want to sort of expand this a little bit and, and look at the world at large, because we each individually are part of a collective unconscious, that the work that we do on an individual level supports the collective consciousness of this community and the community beyond that. And so as we look at the idea of doing shadow work, the, the benefits are that when we become clear when we become that clear light where there's, there isn't any shadow, where spirit is sifting through us in all its perfection so that the wholeness of spirit is the wholeness we experience, we bring so much light into the world. And yet, I don't know about you, but when I look out in the world, I'm seeing a lot of discord and disagreement and other people's shadows that are showing up. <laughs> And, the, you know, the funny thing about a shadow, right, the closer it gets to the light, right, the less it is, the less we see the shadow. And so the more that we do our work and shine our light, the more we bring greater wisdom and peace and healing to the planet. And boy, it feels to me like the, the planet really needs it. You know, one group will... Um, fight vigorously to support the right to bear arms, and another group will support vigorously the, the right to protect children. One group will support the needs for people to be able to express them at themselves exactly the way they are, and another group will try to protect their families from atypical ways of being. There's, there's points of view in all of this, and what I've noticed is when we get really attached to our point of view, it's typically because there's something underneath that point of view that we are holding strong and telling everybody else that they should see it this way. Well, typically there's some shadow attached to that, some trigger, some old experiences that are causing people to, to hold to their points of view regardless. I did some work with NVC nonviolent communication. And in that body of work of nonviolent communication, it involved dialogues where people would actually, instead of just disagreeing with each other, they would actually sit down and get curious and ask questions like, why do you feel that way? 
what, what is it in your experience that brought you to this point? What is it in your experience that helps you, un you see the world this way? Nothing that, you know, nonviolent communication is about asking questions, about being present, and about being curious. Curious for asking someone about their point of view, asking them why, and, and, and mostly what questions and how questions. Those are the ones that are easier to answer for people. And when we do that, I've had that experience, and I bet a lot of you have too. When we do that, when we, when we are willing to sit down with somebody and be present with them and really listen to them and be curious, it's like the, it's like the sunlight of the spirit begins to shine because we're willing to see each other as we are. And the, the really cool thing about doing our own indi individual shadow work is that when we get into these social situations when people bring up something and then it brings up something in us and then it's like, oh, am I going to get into it? When we do the shadow work, we recognize the shadow that might have us holding strong to our opinions and the good news is you may still feel the way you feel about a particular point of view, but it won't be so charged when somebody else sees it differently. Instead, you'll be like, oh, that person sees it differently. <laughs> it'll, be, it'll be easy. It'll be gentle. You'll be able to be loving in conversations. So the benefit of doing this shadow work is not just for our own transformation. It's also for planetary transformation. It's about being present with one another and not um, responding from what some folks refer to as the gap. The gap is our conscious understanding and our subjective understanding and, and, may, and when there's a gap between that, that's the shadow. That's the unconscious that we're not aware of. And when we lean into that, when we're willing to see that within ourselves, we're we begin to shine a light so bright that love happens, that there's an opportunity for healing, that we get to show up authentically, not with a bunch of baggage behind us that's got us locked into some kind of proverbial prison from past experiences, but coming whole and clear and available to each other. And so I, I think that this idea of exploring the, our subconscious and our unfelt experiences, our unprocessed emotions, our uh, things that we've repressed, the, I, I think that's just happening for all of us. And some of us are moving through it more consciously than others. But if you move through it more consciously, then you begin to show someone else another way. It's very much like the Buddhists talk about that place of unattachment, right? Where we, we recognize the facts. We recognize what we're seeing out there. It, while it isn't, it isn't representative of wholeness sometimes, it still is there before us. And so to approach it with, from a place of loving kindness we actually do our part in healing the world and creating a world that works for all. There was a um, wonderful dialogue that a uh, number of us were having about the idea of change and where we find ourselves in that, that evolution of change in the planet. And one of my colleagues wrote um, a beautiful essay and I want to share it with you. It was... a. Uh, Beverly Rose from Hawaii, Reverend Beverly Rose from Hawaii, and we were talking about how to approach change. And she writes, we are in a great turning. Lightworkers are activating their spiritual practices and their actions towards demonstrating a deeper truth of oneness. We're creating new systems and structures that are free from all oppression this is a poignant moment that is ripe for change. Where are we in this massive shift? 
And then she begins to ask us to consider some things. And so I'm going to share her questions with you that you might want to consider for yourself. When you find yourself in one of those places where you can feel it, right? There's a little tension, that person's saying it this way, you're thinking about it another way. What are the questions you can ask yourself when you f find yourself in that situation? She asked, are we making space or taking space? Are we supporting the underserved, underrepresented, and underprivileged? Are we loving our alleged enemy and blessing those who appear to curse us? Are we turning from microaggressions to relentless and devoted practices of micro-kindnesses? Are we holding the dynamic tension of knowing that every time we label another being as inadequate in some way, whether based on behavior or skin color or orientation, gender, political affiliations, or past transgressions, are we aware that we become part of that problem when we place those labels on those experiences? Are we moving from comparison consciousness to compassionate consciousness? Are we righting the wrongs while lifting everyone up? Do we create a society where everyone's lights shines? Are we using paradoxical loving kindness, loving the oppressed and the oppressors both? These are big questions. Are we renouncing pride and abiding in humility? Are we allowing space for grace, a power greater than personal or public opinion? She fin finishes up her essay by saying, it all makes a difference. This is the time for action and engagement. We're all needed on the center stage to make our world more equitable, just, and fair for total freedom and liberation from all of our aligned and combined tragic pasts. These actions will help heal and transform to ensure that we really do live out loud. So my invitation to you today and after this month of looking at the shadow and the light and how they interplay, my invitation to you is to be curious when, when you have that knee-jerk reaction, when something really gets you upset. You might be very justified in your concern. And you might be bringing up a lot of past unhealed emotion behind it too that doesn't serve to create cl greater clarity and healing. And so, my friends, let us choose to be clear. Let us choose to be in integrity with the wholeness that is our true nature. Let us allow our lights to shine so bright that the love streaming through us dissolves anything unlike it. Thank you very much. And I don't know about you, but that's a big calling, so let's pray, shall we? <laughs> Let's fortify ourselves. And so as we move into this place of prayer, know with me that there is a beautiful, pure, golden light. And in that light is all the immutable qualities of God, of beauty and freedom, of love, of truth. And as we align ourselves with this wholeness that is the presence, I know for each one that that light shines so brightly within the inner confines of our hearts and our minds that we see that which we need to release, that which we need to let go of. We allow that light to lead us in the not knowing in being curious and being open to possibility. And I know for each one 
that there is a love so strong within each individual that it brings forward all the resources we need to be that healing light, to be that healing presence in our own lives and in the lives of all those around us. And as I speak this word, I envision beautiful concentric circles turning in and outside of each other. And that these circles come together to remind us that we are all one. Different reflections of the same. And so we surrender our hearts to this highest knowing, this highest understanding of who we are and who we've come here to be. And we walk through the world being peace, being beauty, being joy, and being love. And it is with a grateful heart that I know this reality for each and every human being. And I know that for each and every individual in the sound of my voice that wherever we are, love resides. And we anchor this powerful truth by saying together, and so it is. Thank you.